And good morning, Sunday School class. Welcome to Sunday School. We have heard the bell ring, and it's time for us to get started. We welcome our live streamers that are tuned in as well. And if you're new with us on live stream, we welcome you to our Sunday School hour this morning. I understand some from some distance are tuned in this morning. And a few of us in this room are tuned in this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you're here. God bless you. Thank you for being in Sunday School this morning. We will have prayer and get started with our Sunday School class uh, this morning, ASAP. Uh, prayer requests, prayer requests. Let's start on this side and move across. Any particular requests for prayer? We're praying for, yes, Bev. Yes, have two of our families traveling back from the graduation in Pensacola today. This afternoon at some point, we'll pray for them for Journey Mercy's long trip up there. Long ride up there, isn't it? All right. Yes. Yes, Sam got a stress test this week coming up in preparation for some other things. Perhaps if they were communicate with them about what's happening, let's pray for Sam this week. Stress test. And pray for Yvonne. Um, I guess she'll be here momentarily. I trust she will. I don't see her yet. But anyway, this is Yvonne's last Sunday with us today before she takes off for the regions beyond. Been a few change-ups in their plans, but her house is sold. She's got to get out. Got to go. So we'll pray for Yvonne in the transition that she's making with her family. Any other requests on this side before we move across? All right, all right, Patty and Patrick have a contract on their house. They're praying for the Lord's uh, leadership in, in that, concerning the, the sale of it. I'm very biased in the way that I pray about that. I'm praying for the Lord to block the sale of their house and let the air out of the tires of their car and let their engine break down. No, seriously, uh, let's just pray for the Lord's will concerning their, their transitioning to Pennsylvania. All right, moving across the way, Mavis. Yeah, all right. Yes. Yes, Jerry Wiggins is in the same rehab center now in Orange City. Yes, he is. Okay, yes, she was having uh, foot surgery. Carmen was. We'll pray for her, yes. And there's Yvonne. See, am I in your spot? Lord willing, creek don't rise. So another hand over here. Yes, Jerry. Okay, pray for Jerry. She has uh, testing done on, on Wednesday. Uh, they did an MRI on my brain recently. They found nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. <laughs> no brain, no nothing. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jerry's in room 161. 161, Jerry Wiggins in Orange City. And I'm having eye surgery Friday. Okay. All right, for sure, the eye surgery. Laser? No, um, we'll do a cataract on the Okay. Right. Cataract surgery Friday. Let's pray for Shirley as she has eye surgery Friday. Another request, another request. Just for safe travel. All right, for travel.
All right, let's pray. Lord, we do thank you this morning for the Lord's Day, for the Sunday School Hour. We thank you for each in attendance in this room and for those that are tuned in live streaming. We ask as we open your word that you would open our hearts to the truths of your word in a few moments together. We do remember these requests now that have been voiced publicly here before you uh, for many health needs that are represented by folks in this room and others that are not able to be here. We do ask for healing and strength and help and for travel safety for those that are traveling today and in the coming days and for Yvonne as she uh, relocates and makes uh, great changes in her life. Father, would you providentially guide her every uh, step, every moment. And would you bless her abundantly, Father, we ask for your, your rich blessings all throughout the services of the day. In every part, we thank you for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's get our Bibles open to Genesis chapter number 12 this morning. Genesis 12. Uh, we uh, were involved in the graduation in Pensacola for two of our family that uh, received their master's degrees. Some of you saw it live stream on uh, on uh, online. I didn't under know that it was being live streamed. I would have behaved a little bit better if, if I no, not really. <laughs> no, but uh, we were able to uh, be involved in that celebration up there on Friday. Drove up Thursday, attended this, the uh, commencement exercises Friday, and then uh, drove back Saturday. Long, long, long trip, but uh, the Lord blessed and gave us uh, journey mercies and provision and, and a good time of rejoicing in the four years work that went into those degrees. Had some unusual things happen along the way. Uh, that's a huge, huge ministry up there. Uh, let's see, you asked me, you say there are 300 and something graduated? Yeah, in that one service, and there were three services. There were three graduation services. I think there were over 900 and something in, in total uh, graduates in the particular one we were in. Just had 300, they read every single name and it was martial law inside that building. They warned us, they said, no vocal participation. Don't say anything, don't make any noises. Well, someone transgressed the rule midway through the service and they stopped. And some dignitary came, did you see it? Came to the platform and said, we will pause right now to remind you there will be no vocal participation and uh, shoo, boom, <laughs> that's it. And it went real well after that. So I had to put away my air horn and my, <laughs> no, no, not really. Didn't want to disrupt the uh, solemn proceedings that were gone. Had another unusual thing happen. This was uh, really, really unusual. Happened to my wife. Should I tell them about it? <laughs> no, okay. Well, I'll tell it anyway. So uh, we're in where these thousands of people are, thousands of people, and uh, we have a, a signed door that you have to enter the auditorium and assigned seats, have tickets to get in and all that, you know. And so we're walking along trying to find our, our door number 11 that we're supposed to be in. And um, there was a family seated on a bench in the corridor there, long, uh, round, circular corridor going into the building. And uh, a lady seated on the bench says, look, there's a lady wearing the same dress I'm wearing. Talking about my wife. And she looked at her and said, Peggy? And she said, Beverly? <laughs> well, they were friends of ours uh, on the mission field, connected with the mission board ages ago, back in the late 70s, early 80s, that we had not seen forever, forever. And... Anyway, we had a little bit of a reunion there with him. The Alley Good family, Charles and, and Peggy Alley Good, but of, of all the places in the world. But it's a long story. You say, well, what were they doing there? And they were probably thinking, well, what are, what are you doing there? Uh, well, we were there because two of our adult children are getting their master's degree diplomas. And they were there because their daughter's son was graduated from college. Their daughter's a missionary in Peru. She's married to a Peruvian national, and uh, he was graduating from college. They'd all come up. The family was there from Peru and everything. But anyway, had a little bit of a reunion. It was a, a valuable time, good time of, of uh, just kind of catching up after many, many, many years. Okay, appreciate your concern for prayer for us in our absence uh, these, these days. And glad to be back home. Ain't no place like home. 
Genesis chapter 12. We've been studying uh, for some weeks now this this concept of um, in the Bible of it's it's not a, a word that is, is used uh, exactly like this. It's used in a different context in Scripture. Dispensations. Or we've been studying dispensationalism. Now, biblical dispensationalism or dispensations is simply a reference to the fact that recorded in history, there are periods of time in which God dealt with people in particular ways. And those times changed from time to time. We see uh, essentially seven easily identifiable dispensations or periods of times in Scripture. There are uh, five of them past that are history for us that we can read about in the Bible. There's one of them present in which we live. We're living in a dispensation. And there's one which is yet future. Now that's just the basic framework. It's not any sort of a secret doctrine or any sort of a of a, of a weird thing, but it's, it's rather uh, an organized way of studying Scripture to make some sense of it. And I've alluded to the fact that if you don't embrace uh, some, uh, some version of dispensationalism, if you don't use some version of that, then you can't make good sense out of the Scripture because there are seeming contradictions because of changes that God has made. Now, God hasn't changed and man hasn't changed. We're the same rotten scoundrels that always have been on earth. How long did it take before uh, the, first, uh, the first family had a murder? Brother killed his brother. Uh, nothing's changed, hasn't it? We have the same thing. We get shocked by all sorts of things that are happening today. But anyway, dispensations. We've uh, studied in our series so far the, the dispensation of innocence in the Garden of Eden. And then there was, after the expulsion, the dispensation of conscience, then that of, of human government, uh, ending with the Tower of Babel when languages were confused and humankind was spread across uh, the face of the earth. And we currently are in, uh, in the fourth dispensation, that of promise. We began in Genesis 12 uh, last time with Abraham receiving this promise of God, where God made specific promises to Abraham and his seed and his, his offspring, his children. Remember we said that in the beginning, Abraham had no children. He had no son. And yet his son, or his name, Abram, before it was changed, meant uh, great father. Unusual name for a man that's not a dad yet, wasn't it? Of course, God knows all things before uh, they happen anyway, but that was his name. And as he answered the call, uh, God spoke to him, revealed himself to him when he was uh, 75 years old, when he departed from Haran and had headed toward the, the promised land, the land of Canaan, uh, that is. It was a land that was occupied by uh, other peoples. It was uh, not a vacant uh, land. It was not a place where they were just ready to check in and, and start uh, multiplying and, and improving uh, the landscape. But uh, God had made promises. And uh, let's get down to verse number 7 now as, as we continue. Uh, we'd, we'd studied the Abrahamic covenant in verses 2 and 3. But in, in 7, as, as Abram uh, gets into the, to the land, verse 7, The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel uh, on the west and high on the east. There he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, this, this particular instance, as Abraham uh, arrives in, in the land, he, he takes care of first things first. Uh, I guess there are, are applications and lessons that we can extract and, and draw from this. But the first thing that Abraham took care of when he arrived at the, at the land was taking care of business with God. I think there's a good principle in that for us today. Uh, we, we're cumbered about with a lot of things in our lives, aren't we? A lot of concerns, 
a lot of demands, a lot of distractions, so to speak, a, a, lot, of, a lot of stuff. I use the word sometimes, and we are. But first things first. I think that's good on a daily basis. I, I try to practice that. And my wife and I diligently try to practice that, and we try to, uh, to make that a, a principle in our life that uh, we just stick with uh, carefully and, and, and closely. Uh, I would say rigidly, but there are times you, you have to be flexible and you have to make changes. You know, we, we recently, uh, as I said, uh, took a trip up to Pensacola. We stayed in a KOA campground, and... Uh, we, we did not have a camper trailer or anything with us, so we had to use one of their little camping cabins. And uh, we stayed with two families in our little camping cabin. I'm not sure that it's actually designed for, for two families, but uh, we had a, uh, they gave us the bedroom with a queen size bed. And that was nice, that was really nice. Everybody else was bunked out in the loft on mattresses on the ground or, or out on the, on the couch in a fold away and everything. But the only hitch to it was uh, the bathroom door came through our bedroom, and if anybody went to the bad bathroom, he had to come through our bedroom, which is all right. I said, don't worry, I'll close my eyes tight. <laughs> you know, if you close your eyes, nobody can see you, right? And uh, so uh, obviously we had to make a few adjustments in, in our routine, our schedule. Now we're used to getting up early, 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 and we did there too. Uh, five o'clock in the morning, of course, the time changed there. It was four o'clock for us. And the brain snaps on, say, it's time to go. Time to get up and go. Grab that Bible and get the coffee pot and, uh, and do what we like to do first thing. That is, uh, get the coffee going and, and get the, the Bible and, and maybe some, uh, some mixed nuts. And, and uh, we like to, to sit and spend time with the Lord for, for one hour for, for beginners, just to start the day. And that's... Now that's his things first. Now, are there other things on our mind? Well, yeah, unlike where we were. You know, you got kids and, and family stuff camped out everywhere in the loft and in, in the floor in front of the door where you can't get out of the cabin. And uh, people coming in and out of the, the bedroom, going to the bathroom and so forth. And you don't want to disturb people. So we had to make some adjustments. I used the word flexible a while ago. We do have to be somewhat flexible. But we found a spot where we could go and, and open our Bibles and and uh, have our coffee and time with, with the Lord. You have to improvise, and, and sometimes you have to postpone and adjust your schedule and do different things. But the example that Abram gives us, as soon as he arrived in the land, uh, he builds an, an altar, and the place is called Bethel. Bethel. Now, it's, it's significant because the name Bethel simply means house of God, house of God. And he made it a priority in his life uh, to, to establish a place of communication with, with God. He built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. Now, I know we're talking about dispensations, and there are some change-ups. Now, we have uh, here in our church uh, what we call an, an, an altar, and it's simply some, uh, some, some wood frame carpet-covered uh, things where uh, you could come and, and, and kneel. It's, it's called an, an, an altar. Okay, is it, is it possible for you to do business with, with God anywhere else besides that altar? Well, obviously it is. Um, let's suppose that, that during an invitation, uh, God's dealing with your heart about something. Can you do business with God standing there in your seat just the same way? Well, of course you can. You can, uh, but there are special places where you take care of special things with the Lord, even designated places where we do business with God. There's nothing uh, spooky or strange about that. Uh, I think there's, there's something significant about uh, an altar at, at church because it, it requires uh, some decision, some statement, it requires some purpose, and sometimes it seals it seals a decision before witnesses, 
and even for yourself. And you know, you're saying the same. Well, I can, I can talk to God right here. I don't have to go down there. And it's true, you do. But sometimes a purposeful action on our part seals a decision that we're making. Uh, it helps us remember when we do business with God. And in part, that's based on this passage, Genesis 12. Uh, he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of, of the Lord. So there was a particular place, there was a particular arrangement, there was a particular thing that lent itself to Abram doing business with God at, at that place. And as I said, dispensationally, uh, we understand that there are certain things that were true in other times that are not now, but there is a principle that is uh, involved in this, and that is uh, with, with God, who is not visible with our eyes, is to be communicated with and worshipped and uh, interacted with. Uh, it helps us to have a particular place where we're in the practice of doing that. I use the word practice instead of habit. Uh, habits can be good if they're directed in the right, right way. You know that? You know, we often talk about bad habits, and there are certainly a lot of bad habits, aren't there? But there are good habits, too. Brushing your teeth is a good habit, isn't it? It is. It helps you, and it helps everybody else, too. It's a good thing. But spiritually, there are, are good habits. Um... I mentioned to you, not trying to set up ourselves as an exemplar, would not do that at all. I'm, I'm just letting you in a little bit of, of something that some of you already know, and, and that is it takes a lot of effort and decision and purpose to, to establish a time where you meet with, with God. It does. You won't accidentally do it. You won't be just sitting around and it just, just strike you. Okay, it's just, it's just time to meet with God. No, it takes a conscious decision. It takes some effort. It takes some organization, uh, so we, we like to do that. Uh, my, my wife and I have a particular place, a particular time, a particular uh, format. You say, well, that can become dull routine, can't it? Well, it can be, just like a marriage can. Did you know that a marriage can become dull and routine and old and drearisome and, and wearying if you let it? But if you don't let it, it can become, it can, can remain vibrant and exciting and fresh. And anything's like that, if, if you let it to become stale and outdated, it can. But if we seek the Lord, if we seek after him, if we seek his face, if we're looking to his word, and we're seeking uh, God's ways and his voice, and you say, uh, do you actually hear the voice of God? Uh, no, not audibly, but there are times that he impresses you by his spirit just as distinctly as if he had said something audibly. There are times it's just that real. It really is. You say, I've never experienced that, and keep on. Keep on and move closer to the Lord and, and place yourself uh, more at his disposal, and you will experience a closeness to the Lord uh, that can flow from that. And here we have a great example from Abram uh, moving into to Canaan, the promised land. And the, the, the place is called Bethel. It's the house of God, the house of God. And he establishes an altar there. It's not the last time we'll see it. Uh, we'll see it again. It uh, repeats again. And you've perhaps heard messages preached uh, back to Bethel or the concept back to Bethel. Well, it means you just get back to where you were, where you met with God. There is a sense in which all of us need to return back to Bethel. There's a sense in which all of us need to return back to the former things, uh, when we had a, a closer, more intimate uh, relationship with, with, with God. Uh, that's called revival, isn't it? It's a return. It's life again. It's a renewed uh, existence with God. Not that you get saved all over again, uh, but that you give new life and new meaning and freshness and reviving uh, to, to our relationship. And would it surprise you to, to hear me say, America needs revival. Our nation needs reviving. 
needs life again. This is nearly dead spiritually, and it needs reviving. Uh, we need reviving. And so the scripture records Abraham's journey going on uh, still toward the south. And there's, there's a parenthetical thing that happens uh, now in verses 10 through the, through the end of the chapter. And, and we'll go ahead and address that now because there's some principles in, in this. Now in the fourth dispensation, that of promise, the dispensation of promise where God makes promises to Abram. Uh, verse 10, there was a famine in the land. And Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. It came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah his wife, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Uh, therefore, well, let me, let me pause. I need to hit something before we get to the actual uh, happenings here. Was Abraham in or out of God's will? in leaving the land of blessing, land of promise, and going to Egypt seeking, seeking relief in the famine. That's hotly dis disputed among a lot of, of people. Some will insist, well, he was uh, just protecting his, his people, his family, uh, everything in his, his charge, and so he was doing the best that he could do. Others would uh, plainly say, you know, Egypt is symbolic of, of sin and uh, of everything that's against God. And when he resorted to look to the world, to the things against God, uh, to meet his needs, he was out of the will of God. I'll let you decide for your own what you think about that. But some things happened in Egypt, and they weren't good. They weren't good. Uh, he, he said to his wife, verse 11, um, Behold, now I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see thee, they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with thee for my sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. It came to pass when Abram was coming to Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Princes also Pharaoh saw her and, commen and commended her before Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And he entreated Abram well for her sake, he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Thou didst not tell me that she was thy wife. Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her uh, to me to wife. Now therefore behold thy wife take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh command, command, commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. Well, there's, there's a mysterious thing that happens here, and some would say, well, he just, he just flat out lied about his, his wife uh, to protect his own hide, to save his own hide. Well, there was a sense in which she was his sister, in, in the old biblical way of reckoning, because they were relatives, and uh, he was, shall we say, stretching the truth. Stretching the truth. You ever do that? You ever stretch the truth? There's another word for it. It's called lying. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, sometimes it's convenient to stretch the truth and to say things a certain way and to cause people to draw certain conclusions that you know are not right, but they're convenient. It's called lying. It's called lying. Uh, some people call it white lies. They say, well, it wasn't a, wasn't a black lie. It was a white lie. That's treacherous too, isn't it? Uh, it either is the truth or, or it isn't. But anyway, he hatched this uh, scheme to save his own hide, and he almost got uh, in bad trouble because of it, but it was, it was exposed. And uh, I guess the Pharaoh was uh, noble enough that he says, uh, you've, you've caused me great uh, strife because of this, because the Lord, I don't know what the nature of it was, but it says the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues. I don't know what it was specifically, but we know later in history about plagues in Egypt, don't we? And they weren't pleasant things. They were bad things. They were destructive, even deadly things in the end. So we're just going to assume that these great plagues that God 
uh, had placed upon Pharaoh's house uh, were because of him taking Sarah uh, into his harem, so to speak, uh, possibly as a candidate for a wife of his, and it displeased God. And incidentally, does this give us a little, any kind of an insight on God's attitude toward marriage, toward a man and his wife? Does it give us any inkling? Does it give us a window to the mind of God about this? It really does, doesn't it? It really does. Now we can get to the nitty gritty and we can get to some very controversial issues in this. Uh, I know, uh, but it'd be best for us to, to leave it just exactly where, where God does. And that is, he takes very seriously uh, this matter of marriage of a man and his wife. And we could expand that to other areas like we will in the morning message this morning. God takes very seriously all sin issues. Men make fun of them, make jokes about them, and wink at them. You know what I'm talking about? God's not amused. And so he took very seriously this. And when the truth came out that Abram had told a half-truth, a story, a lie, uh, about Sarah, his wife, uh, that they essentially were run out of Egypt, were expelled, which leaves us with a huge question now at this point. Was, was Abram in or out of the will of God? And he said, you can decide that for, for yourself. Uh, but I would just alert you to this, that any time you see a reference to Egypt in Scripture, it's not good. It's connected with sin, uh, with uh, idolatry, with, with wrongdoing, with, with wickedness. And uh, we, we would just have to ask uh, several questions about that. Well, getting on to chapter 13, Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that they had, and Lot with him. Uh, into the south. Now it wasn't the south of Egypt, but they went up north and then they went south from there. And Abram was very rich in, in cattle and silver and gold. And uh, he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, under the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now, here in the beginning of chapter 13, we have uh, Abram going back to Bethel. Okay, there had been a, a lapse. There had been a hiatus. There had been an interim period in, in Egypt where we would assume that Abram was not right with God, where he was stepping out of the will of God. That's my opinion. And now when Abraham gets back, Abram gets back, he goes back to Bethel. He goes back to the altar, and he returns to calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, what do we have in, in Egypt? Uh, do we have any record in these intervening verses about Abram calling on the Lord's name and any relationship between uh, Abram and, and the Lord there? Well, we don't. You say, you don't think he ever prayed? or talk to God while he was in Egypt? Well, he may have, but it's not recorded. Uh, that tends to make us believe that he had forsaken the land of promise, the land of blessing, the promised place. Which brings us to another question, to another question. If you're in a spot where God wants you, is he going to take care of you? Is he going to provide for you? Is he going to protect you? Is he going to take care of stuff for you? Is God going to do that? He is. Well, what if you step out from the place where God wants you and you go off on your own? Uh, is it possible that problems will arise and that you have difficulties? The answer is yes. And we see that modeled for us in, in this passage. I, I know that we could go to seed on that concept. Uh, I know that we could um, go to the point that some have, I think, treacherously by saying that uh, every single moment of the day you've got to be walking exactly in the path that God wants you and if you, if you stray, if you, if you don't uh, explicitly follow uh, God at every turn of the way, then he's just, he's just going to abandon you, he's going to desert you, he's going to withhold his blessing from you, and, and you're in trouble. 
Well, that teaching would actually produce a, a fearful walk with God, wouldn't it? I'd be afraid I would mess up and just take one step the wrong direction, and the Lord would zap me. He would just judge me and get me uh, for that. Well, could the Lord do that? Well, of course he could. Would he be justified in doing that if, if he chose to? Well, of course he would. But at the same token, remember we have a loving, merciful, gracious, and patient God. Aren't you thankful for the grace, love, patience, and mercy of God? That he doesn't just nail us at every, every time. He doesn't declare martial law like we saw in that graduation ceremony. Bang! <laughs> no, uh, zero tolerance. Don't do that. You're going you're gonna to get it next time. And God doesn't treat us that way. Now, we, we need to blend that with other character traits of God. And I mentioned one already. God doesn't wink at sin. He's not amused by sin. He's not pleased when we sin. He doesn't make jokes about sin. He expects his children to walk righteously, circumspectly. And um, that's why the scripture says, Be ye holy as I am holy. God expects holiness out of us. But he's, he's loving, he's merciful, he's patient. He remembereth our frame. He knoweth that we are dust. He knoweth that we are dust. Now that's not a very glamorous way to t talk about human beings. Uh, just piles of dirt, right? That's basically what we are. Uh, from dust we came, from to, to dust we'll return uh, after, after we're gone. God knows that. Uh, he is uh, patient. He's long-suffering. Uh, I thank God for second chances, for second chances. You ever had a second chance from God? Well, you have, every one of you, because you're here. We're here this morning, so we've had second chances. Uh, we've messed up and, and made a, a wreck of, of things, perhaps in a big way in, in your life, and yet God gives you opportunities to reconcile to certain people and to certain situations and to take care of things. Second chances. He is the God of second chances. And I would like to, to blend those truths that we see in Scripture uh, with also the truth, truth that he's the God of justice, righteousness, and he, he's a God that doesn't mess with sin. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us as blessed children of his. And he knows exactly what our needs are and what we're faced with and our failures and all the rest. And he still loves us. And he still provides for us. Now, we should not be presumptuous. You know what presumptuous is? It reminds me of a word that David used in one of the Psalms. And he said, uh, keep thy servant from presumptuous sin. Presumptuous sin. I don't know all that that means, but I can explain it like this in a way that we could understand. It would be like if, if I were to say about any particular sin, whatever it may be, well, I know that's a sin. I know that God doesn't like that, but it's what I want to do, so I'm going to do it anyway because I know God will forgive me, and after I do it, I can ask God's forgiveness, and he'll forgive me, and we can go on. That's presumptuous sin. You're presuming upon the good graces of God. You're presuming that God will always be patient and restore and forgive. And we know that he will. But he's also a God who says, that's it. You've crossed the line. You're done. I think we could couple that with New Testament teachings such as this one. There is a sin unto death. A sin unto death. There, there is a point at which a child of God, a Christian, can sin, 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 and God will say, that's enough. That's enough. I'm going to take you to heaven. I'm going to take you out of here. Does it mean you're lost, you go to hell? No. But it means he takes you away from being a stumbling block, a bad example to someone else, and he takes you home to heaven. So there's, there's a whole lot that's bound up in the example that we have from, from Abraham Abram, uh, we would, would ask questions about Abram. We'd say, well, do you think he was saved? Uh, I know that's a, a troublesome concept for Old Testament saints. I remember uh, being in, in Bible college 
and having uh, a paper to write in one of my more thought-provoking classes. Uh, and the, the paper was based on this question. Do you think that uh, King Saul was saved or not? And we had to write a paper and we had to defend it from, uh, from the Bible using biblical passages to say whether King Saul was saved or not. And um, predictably, there was a mixed reaction in our class. And as we read these papers and as we debated and discussed a little bit about these questions, there were some that gave ironclad reasons why they think that, that Saul could not possibly have been saved. And others gave reasons why they thought, well, sure, he was saved, but he was disobedient, he was in sin. And I, th I think the exercise by this professor was to get us to think a little bit about some things, and, and that it did. But anyway, we get back to the concept of, of Old Testament saints, whether they were saved or whether they, they, they weren't. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of hard for us to get a good handle on, on that, uh, but, but here's something that will help something will help. How were people saved in the Old Testament? How were they saved? What was the basis of their salvation in the Old Testament? By faith. By faith. Same way that we're saved now. By faith. I know that's a hard concept for us to grasp. You say, well, believing what? Well, believing God. Uh, believing in God, and let's leave it at that. Some of them had um, faith in God looking ahead to the payment for sin. It was yet future. We have faith in God looking back to the payment of God for sin. Isn't that an interesting concept? That it's faith in God for the forgiveness of sin. They had faith in God for their sins to be forgiven, looking ahead, we have faith in God for our sins to be forgiven, looking back. You say, but Jesus had not come and paid the price yet. Well, from God's perspective, it's all the same. <laughs> the past, the present, and the future. And so what I'm trying to get around to, when we look at Old Testament saints and try to decide whether they were saved, we would say they were saved by faith. Uh, whenever we see uh, strong examples of faith were, were driven to conclusions. I think that Abram was saved because he had faith in God. Well, actually, he, um, he attained the name. Uh, he, he really deserved the name, Father of the Faithful. He had faith in God. His faith was evidenced through his obedience. Now, he wasn't good because of his obedience, but he was obedient uh, because of his goodness, because of his faith in, in, in God. So obviously he was a believer. Uh, he was uh, the, the father of the faithful. He believed in God. We can take other examples in Scripture of different ones who uh, did not portray that. And you say, well, I don't think he was saved. Well, uh, that's, of course, up to them and God. And, and you can have your, your opinion about those things. But as we look at an Old Testament saint... We do call him a saint because he was a believer. He was uh, one who possessed faith in, in God. I think that some of these events that God recorded in his word are for our benefit. Not because uh, misery loves company. You heard that old saying, misery loves company? You say, well, we're in good company because uh, Abram was, he was a rascal too. You know, he, he told lies and, and so forth. It's not for that purpose. It's for our admonition and it's for our encouragement at times when we can say, you know what, I have messed up and God has given me a chance to rectify some of those things and I'm thankful that he is the God of second chances. And so here he leaves uh, Egypt. He leaves the, the land of sin. He goes back to the place of blessing. And so if we were to, to ask you, how stringent is, is God? Well, I, I'm treading on some, some territory that we've been reminded of in the past few hours. It would be territory that the, the Rooney family would be acquainted with and that we would and perhaps others. 
And it gets back to the place where you're serving God, the place of service. Are you in the right place? Are you in the right place? Uh, back in, in, the, in the 70s, uh, when we uh, made our commitment to go to Mexico and, and eventually uh, moved our, our family down there, it was, uh, it was what we felt God wanted us to, to do in service. I have no doubt about that. I have no question about that now. And as we assimilated into the, to the Mexican culture and setting everything, uh, it soon became my heart's desire to do nothing else the rest of my life except live in Mexico and be another Edward Abbott and serve the Lord just like that and pour his heart and soul into, into to that area. And we did for, for years. And God suddenly closed the door. Boom. And we had some discussions about that in the past two days. And uh, I was devastated in ways, was confused in other ways. This, this is where God called us. We came back to the States and checked with other mission boards and other places to, uh, to reaffiliate and to relocate and to, uh, to change, change up the, some things so we could continue where uh, we knew that God had placed us and the door was closed everywhere. And there were some other doors open. Uh, there was a door open in, in Philadelphia. And God seemingly gave direction to, to that area. And uh, just before we came back to, to Deltona in, in 1983, uh, we had received a, a call to be on staff, assistant pastor at a, a large and influential and effective church in uh, Philadelphia, the, the Ben Salem Baptist Church, you know nothing about the church now, and uh, we felt sure that's exactly where the Lord's going to, to use us. And yet through a series of circumstances, uh, it became very crystal clear, God's not in this. He doesn't want us in Philadelphia, and we were sure that he did. And we were actually coming uh, back through Deltona just to greet our family that lived here and to collect our, our earthly possessions that were stored at the border of Mexico and Texas and to move them to, uh, to Philadelphia. And the Lord changed up a lot of stuff in our lives. And uh, I struggled with a lot of things about where I should be. Should I be in Mex Mexico? Should I be in Philadelphia? Should I be in Delta? Well, but I made this one bad mistake. One bad mistake. I don't know if Tom ever made a mistake like this, but I made it. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere in the world except Deltona, Florida. Not Deltona. I'll go to Philadelphia. I'll go to Mexico. I'll go anywhere, but not Deltona. You say, did you hate Deltona that bad? No, I just had reasons why I didn't want to be in, in Deltona. And that's exactly where the Lord put us. Exactly where he put us in, in 1983. So I'm telling you that I struggled with this concept of where should you be? Is the land of blessing a particular geographical spot where you need to be? And that gives rise to the question, does God care where you are? Well, obviously he does. Obviously he does. Now we could, I know we could go to the opposite extreme to the polar extreme of this, and we could voice what some people say, say, it just doesn't matter where you are as long as you're living for God. Well, that's, that's to say God didn't care where you lived. God didn't care about a lot of stuff, it just, just as long as you're, you're right with him. Well, you can't be right with him without some other things being true as well. Uh, but anyway, I say that about the Runes because they've recently made some transitions, uh, some huge changes in their life. We did the same thing. And I know some of the turmoil and the questions and some of the stuff that comes up. I do. Really, really do. Well, Abraham was the same way. So now he goes back. He goes back to the promised place, uh, to the place of blessing, to the altar that he built uh, there at, at Bethel. And, and it says, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So we read between the lines and we take from the record that is given here that Abraham got back to the place of blessing and he got back to the place where he jumped off. I think he did jump off and jump out of the will of God 
and he paid a price for that and nearly cost him his life and now he returns back to Bethel. So that little phrase, if we could just use that and let that reverberate uh, in our, our hearts and our lives, back to Bethel, it may not be a geographical place, but it may be a particular spot in the history of our lives where we can return back to a right relationship with God. It may be uh, a geographical place. Do you have a special place where you've done business with God before and it's almost like there's a memorial there? I have some of those. Uh, some of those places where there's a time of remembering uh, when, when God did some very precious and blessed things. And in essence, that's not like going back to Bethel uh, for, for Abraham. So this is, is given to us uh, in two ways as, as an encouragement and as a warning. And I think both of those are appropriate and are uh, adequate for us to, to use concerning his experience in going to Egypt uh, out of the will of God and returning to the place of blessing. There is a warning and there's an encouragement. The warning is uh, don't step out of God's will and, and don't take things into your own hands. You know, there's a strange uh, human common denominator about uh, a lot of things that, that we do, and that would be sometimes when we grab hold and, and take things into our own hands, we mess them up. Ever do that? You just grab hold of it and you say, I'll fix that. We'll do this and do this, and, and you just mess it up royally. And so there's a warning. Be careful that we don't grab hold, take things into your own hands, and, and do them in your own fleshly strength and power, and your own fleshly wisdom. Now, God gives us a brain to use, I know that, uh, but don't depend on your own fleshly wisdom. Uh, use the mind of Christ, the mind of God, and allow his wisdom to flow through yours and guide you. So there's a warning, but there's also an encouragement. There is recovery, there is blessing, there is hope, and there is help. Now, sometimes you can uh, never go back uh, to a certain place. Sometimes doors are closed forever. And, and that's it. Other times God graciously allows uh, more opportunities. Well, I wish we had more time to talk about that, but our time has gone this morning. Thank you so much for being in Sunday School. I've spoken to you from my heart this morning about this uh, in our fourth dispensation, that of promise. And let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the time together in your word this morning. So would you bless the truth that we've seen from Scripture? And I don't know the needs of the folks that are here before me and those that are distant tuned in, live streaming. Uh, but Lord, would you take the truths and the principles and the lessons from your word and make them clear and make them uh, applicable in all of our hearts and lives as we yield to you this day. Bless in the moments we have before the service begins. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.